Bible class tonight um, as we deal with Psalm 6. Psalm 6. And remember, we are, uh, don't forget Genesis now, because this fall we're going to go back to Genesis. We stopped at Genesis 12. So do not forget Genesis. We're going to go part 2 of Genesis this fall. So um, in the spring and the summer, we will continue with Psalms. But uh, before we get started, let us bow our hands for a word of prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you once again for these, your people who are here today to study your word tonight in this Bible class. Bless those who uh, are here. Bless those who wanted to come but just could not make it. Heavenly Father, we ask that you open up our spiritual understanding, that we will receive your word, place, place it in our hearts. Lord, allow us and teach us to grow spiritually in Christ, that it can make a mark on us that can never be erased. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Psalm 6. I'm going to read Psalm 6 in its entirety because I have so much paper up here. So I blew my Bible out the way because I have it written on my other sheets, all of it. And I'm going to have to keep going back to the Bible So, because uh, I have all the scriptures I need in this my text. So let me read it in its entirety, and then we're going to go back and begin to break it down verse by verse. Psalms 6, O Lord, and this is the New King James Version, O Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger, nor chasten me in your hot displeasure. Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I am weak. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are troubled. My soul also is greatly troubled, but you, O Lord, how long? Return, O Lord, deliver me. O oh, save me for your mercy's sake, for in death there is no remembrance of you in the grave. Who will give you thanks? I am weary with my groaning. All night I make my bed swim. I drench my couch with my tears. My eyes waste away because of grief. It grows old because of all my enemies. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity, for the Lord has heard the voice of my weeping. The Lord has heard my supplication. The Lord will receive my prayer. Let all my enemies be ashamed and greatly troubled. Let them turn back and be ashamed suddenly. Amen. So that's Psalms 6. Uh, this is the first of several psalms that are, that are called, if you want to write this down. This is the first of the penitent psalms. Yeah. Penitent psalms. Did you ask the wrong person? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the penitent psalms. Uh, or the psalms for asking for forgiveness. Uh, yes, he's asking for forgiveness. Yeah. Another word for penitent. Asking for Forgiveness. He's making a confession. This is the first. There's several of them we're going to go through. Psalm 6. We're going to write them down real quick. Psalm 6. Psalms 32. 38. 51. 102. 130. And 143. These are called the penitent psalms, or psalms where he is asking for forgiveness. He is confessing his sins and asking God. Uh, 102, 130, and 143. So I can read those again. Psalm 6, Psalms 32, 38, 51, 102, 130, and 143. These are called the penitent psalms. So this is the first one of many. Uh, this psalm is the first of what has come to be known as the seven penitent psalms and the psalms. And these psalms are all about sorrow for sin, the confessing of it, and the turning from it, uh, and the forgiveness which is to be found in the gracious and merciful God. So what we're going to really study tonight, we're going to study about this confession of sins, and then we're going to talk about uh, this confession of sins. Psalm 6 is known very well. Uh, I don't know if you ever read Psalm 6, and this, looking at the first part, and looking at your outline, and where it says Psalm 6, you can look at your outline, David's appeal, point one, 
and part A, what he wants, one and two, verse four and five. Uh, and then we're going to go to point two, do heal my spiritual and physical condition, how long, and then why he wants it, and then part point two, David assurance, and then the study questions. So we'll have those there as well. So let's look at the first part. Looking at verse one, hopefully we get past verse one. There's a lot in verse one. Looking at verse one, a plea to lighten the chastening hand. Oh Lord. Do not rebuke me in your anger, nor chasten me in your hot displeasure. O oh Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger, nor chasten me in your hot displeasure. So here is David calling on God not to what? Rebuke him, chasten him in anger, or chasten him what? in his hot displeasure. Lord, you can chasten me, but don't be angry. And you know God doesn't do that at all anyway. You know that, don't you? When God chastens you, we're going to talk about that, He doesn't chasten you in anger. When we, we, we get to the point of talking about disciplining our kids as well. Do not rebuke me in your anger. Yes? I found Oh, you found it? It's P-E-N-T-I. P-E-N-T-A-L. Okay, for those who wanted to know. Pentonet. It is Pentanol. Yeah, pentanol psalm. Spell it again, folks. P E N T I T E N T A L. And if you look down in your footnotes. Oh, the key of those. Oh, they're all in the outline? Yeah, and all in your bottom. Oh, and those. John MacArthur, study by. Oh, you got a new King James thing. Okay, the new King James thing. It's in there. It's in there. Okay. The pen. What did you read? I'm reading out of the John MacArthur Study Bible. Not the new, you read out of the new, the King James Study Bible. New King James. Okay. All right. So do not rebuke me in your anger. Okay, so we don't know what the occasion of sin is. We don't know. We don't know what he's. Uh, asking God for forgiveness for some people would like to say the sin of Bathsheba. That's because we we're so familiar with that sin. But it could be any sin we don't know. But let's just say, uh, for argument's sake, that's one of them. Let's, let's let's use the sin of Bathsheba. And if you, any one of you remember that sin, he committed adultery with Bathsheba. So, but remember, we got six of these, seven of these pentanal psalms. So it could be either one of these sins, but just remember that one. We, we know that one very well. But uh, David sensed that he was under the rebuke of God. So he had to feel something was going on in his life for him to feel that he was under God's rebuke. I want to do, have we ever felt that way? Have we ever felt that we, we are being rebuked or being chastened by God? God. David evidently must have felt that. He's going to mention it. He's going to mention one way that some people may feel that they're under the rebuke or under the chastening of God. And I think a lot of us still think this way today. Therefore, he called out to God to lighten the chastisement. God, uh, could you please uh, lighten my load? This is very heavy on me. Your chastening is hard on me. Uh, there are many times when we believe we are chastened by God's hand when we really suffer trouble. So one way we think that we are being chastened by God, could be true, is when we're in trouble. Is that true? Mm -hmm. When we're going through trouble, is that a way that God chastens you or disciplines you? It can be. It can be. That's one way. What's another way? Sickness. Now you know you 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 can't go into a word church talking like that now. Because the word first for word of faith, people are gonna tell you, oh no, sister, you're wrong. God doesn't use sickness. He ain't gotta use sickness to chasten you. He doesn't have to do, he don't have to allow anything negative to happen to you to chasten you. Is that true? Is that not true? Yes. So, and once again, 
God himself, watch this, doesn't use, he doesn't tempt you with evil. We already know that from James. James 1. Neither can God be tempted by evil. So God doesn't put it on you. Remember what God does? See, I, I, we already understand that God is the one who's protecting us each and every day. So all God has to do is just step back. He don't have to do nothing to you. Yes. And that, what we call, is chastening. Remember Job? When, when Satan was, uh, God asked Job, uh, have you, asked Satan, have you tried my servant, Job? You know, God, I can't touch him. You have your hedge of protection around him. And when did uh, God say, look now, uh, everything that he has is in your hands, but just don't kill him. That's what he said. So that means God, all God did, he didn't do anything. He didn't do nothing to Job. He just moved out the way. Okay, loose him, all right. He just let him do it. He allows it. He doesn't do the evil to you. He allows it to happen for a reason, for a season. And remember, 1 Corinthians says that God allows it because you can handle it. Remember that? He's not going to allow anything to happen to you that you cannot bear, that you cannot handle. I think we need to preach that every Sunday morning. That you, whatever you go through, whatever it is, you can handle it. That's why all of us don't go through the same thing. We just can't go through the same thing. All of us can't hear the news that our two-year-old got shot. We can't, everybody can't hear that. Everybody can experience that. Some people can and will and have. And some people will never experience losing a baby. Never. God knows what you can bear. God knows that. So for us to put ourselves on the same shoes of other people. I know what you're going through. No, you don't. If you haven't gone through what I've gone through, That's right. you don't know what I've gone through. You can't say that unless you actually been through. So at funerals, when you go up to the repast and you're talking to the family members, please don't use that, that uh, cliche phrase, I know what you're going through. No, don't say that. Unless you've actually gone through what they gone through. Say this to them. What is it that you would have me to do? What is it that you need? I'm here for you. I'll clean your house. I'll cook for you. I'll do something. I want to take some, some, some pressure off you or something away from you so you can you know, be busy, go by yourself, do something for yourself. But what is it that I can do for you? Because in your time of need, I just want to be there for you. That's what you can offer. Just offer your help. Offer your service. Offer some words of encouragement. Don't, but don't say, girl, I know what you're going through. No, you don't. If you haven't lost your mother at the age of 21, then you don't know what a 21-year-old feels like when they lose their mother or father or sister or brother. You know what it feels like to lose a loved one, but you had your mother until you were 60 or 70. So you, you, you can't, you can't expect that's a total different experience. So once again, David is saying here about the chastening of God, because we're going to stay right there for a minute. The chastening of God. He's saying, God, don't chasten me in your anger. Is he telling God to don't chasten him or not chasten him harshly? He's saying, Lord, lighten up the load. I know I'm being chastened. He never, he's never said he didn't commit the sin. He's not admitting that he hasn't sinned. He said, Lord, just a Lighten the load. And I'm telling you, God doesn't put on you no more than you can bear anyway. Maybe David is under the pressure of whatever he's going through. He's going to mention some of the things that he's going through in a minute. But under the pressure of what he's going through, he may feel that he can't make it. So he's calling out to God and saying, God, I just need your help right now. I, I don't think I can make it. This, this is a lot of pressure on me. This, this chastening, I know I've done wrong. But I, I don't feel that I can make it. Could you please lighten the load? Now, something, and I should have said this when we started the, the Psalms from the beginning. Some things, and we're really going to run into it tonight. I think we ran into it a couple of times before, and I didn't get a chance to talk about this fact. When we're dealing with Old Testament scripture, you've got to remember the mind of an Old Testament person. They're not the mind of a New Testament person. 
They, they don't, it's not, their mind is not filled in like your mind is filled in. They don't have all of the truth like you have all of the truth. David didn't have all of the truth like you had. Old Testament saints thought differently than we think because of the information that was fed to them. So you're going to hear David say some things, or some Old Testament people when we go through the Old Testament, say some things that you would think that they knew better to say, but no, not if they didn't have the full revelation. Remember, uh, the book of Hebrews tells us this, that the Old Testament was a guide to Jesus Christ. It was a road map to Christ. So we use the Old Testament to show you that the Messiah is there. He is from Genesis through uh, Malachi. He's being seen in every book. But when you look through their experiences, they uh, didn't have the full revelation that you have that the Messiah is Jesus Christ and that there is an afterlife the way we see it. David's going to talk about the afterlife here. And there's going to be a lot of Psalms that he, because the dead is dead, that's what he's going to just say. Yes. We have a Sunday school class that's called Tights and Shadows. Yes. And that's, the, I mean, that's the whole Old Testament. Okay. And, and that's good because that's what the Old Testament is. But you have some people who would like to take the Old Testament for doctrine. Mm -hmm. Now, they, they, they're, they're walking on shaky grounds when you try to do that. Because we can read a whole lot of Old Testament scriptures that will make your hair stand up on top of your head. Like he says, beat your children, like uh, uh, <laughs> you know, beat your children, they won't die, you know, things like that. Or uh, what about the, the commandment to kill your kid if they're disobedient to you? You just you go further than that. If they, uh, if they do something wrong to you, okay, you can beat them. But if they get too disobedient, okay, you got the right to kill them. That was the law. Stone them so the other kids can learn. Now, we don't do that today. So we got to now pull out from that lesson of what they were talking about, discipline, disciplining your kids. What I wanted to say is about the Old Testament and especially the Psalms, you're going to read a lot of things about anger, you're going to read a lot of things about uh, people thinking he's talking about revenge, but you got to read it from their perspective, not our perspective, which is a New Testament perspective. Theirs is an Old Testament. They didn't have the full revelation that you have about God and about Jesus Christ. And we still don't have everything we need to know about God. We'll do that when we get to heaven. And just think, they didn't have what, have what we have. Because Christ wasn't even there yet. Right, right, right. So he couldn't even explain to them in the Old Testament all the things that we know and understand now about the Old Testament. So just keep that in mind when you read the Old Testament. Now, let's go, go a little bit further. I want to stick with this point in verse 1, where he's dealing with this chastening. Now, somebody turn to Hebrews 12. Don't lose Psalm 6, because Hebrews 12 tells us about God chastening us. Do you believe that God chastens his children? That means disciplines us. Now, we already so we established the fact that you do believe in that. Now, here's the question. How does he do it? How does God discipline you? How can I discipline my children? And let's look at physical discipline. Now, human discipline. Can I, is it, is it possible for me to discipline my kids without hitting them? Yeah. It is possible. Yeah. There's many forms of discipline. So we are in agreement with that too. That uh, you can discipline your children without whipping them. You can. That's just a form of discipline. You know that. They call it corporal punishment. <laughs> uh, you, can, you, can, uh, you can do that. It's almost like people are arguing the fact of the corporal punishment of killing someone for the act of killing someone else. Uh, some states got rid of that law, you know, uh, the, the hanging or uh, putting somebody to death because they killed someone else. Some states don't have that. We call it capital punishment. Uh, some states don't believe that. Michigan is one of them. We don't have capital punishment in this state. But Texas have capital punishment. Some other states got capital punishment. Uh, uh, Los Angeles, as liberal as they are, is a state that still has capital punishment. You can't kill two people 
at the same time, and then you're going to get away with it in California. In California, if you have a double murder, you're going to death row. Automatically. Remember O.J. Simpson, they tried to you know, pin that on him. They want him in the chair, boy. They, 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 they wanted O.J. in the chair. They, they couldn't kill him. But they wanted him for double murder. Now, watch this. So, once again, it, who, okay, who has Hebrews? Is it 12? Starting at verse 5. Somebody read 5 and 6. Hebrews 12. Verse 5 and 6. This is talking about discipline, I think. And you have forgotten the exhortations which speak to you as to sons. My sons do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. Stop. Do not despise the chastening of the Lord. Do not be discouraged when you are what? Rebuked by him. David said, Lord, uh, don't rebuke me too much. He says, don't be discouraged. Okay, keep going. For whom the Lord loves, he chases. Stop right there. God never chases out of anger. David says in Psalm 6, verse 1, Lord, don't chase me, chasing me in your anger. God never does that anyway. Because if he if he chases you, he loves you. Remember that. He doesn't, that means this. If he doesn't chasten us in anger, you shouldn't chase him in anger. You need to calm down. Take a deep breath. Somebody did something wrong to you. Calm down. I know you want to, you know, bust out their windows in their car. No, you, no. He says, this is how you deal with it. You calm down first. Don't do anything in haste. Don't do anything in anger. Because God doesn't discipline in anger. If he disciplines you, he loves you. And I tell people this all the time. If you don't discipline your kid, you don't love them. Now, some people think I'm talking about hitting them. No, I'm not talking about hitting them because you ain't got to hit them. There's many forms of discipline. If you don't discipline your kid, you don't know. Because if they can stand up there and talk to you any kind of way and tell you what they're not going to do, and you just stand there and look at them. That's when you hit them. <laughs> 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 or tell them, you better get out of my face. <laughs> or you go to your room. Before I, before I get too angry, it might have to do something to you. If you don't have some kind of form of correction, for that, that young person, then uh, something is wrong. And even in their adult age, do you understand this? Your children as adults need to respect you as their parents even when they're 50. And you 70. Yeah, they should still respect you. They should always remember that you are the parent and they are the child. They have great kids. That's okay. You still, <laughs> you, the reason they're here is because of you. Now that's kind of that, that's what I try to teach my, my children. That no matter how old you get, no matter how intelligent you become, no matter how much money you make, you're gonna make way more money than me, you are here because God allowed you to come through me. So if it wasn't for God allowing you to come through me, you wouldn't be here. So I just deserve respect now, just because of that alone. I might have a first grade education, but I <laughs> I deserve respect. Because God used me to get you with your smart self here. <laughs> and your money making self here. Okay. And so you have to explain that to them. No matter what, there's a level of respect between father and children that can never be broken. And if you don't establish that, they don't break it. Because they don't think they know more than you and they don't think they're better than you. Now watch this. So he says, oh, keep finishing. Keep, keep reading here, verse uh, 5, 6. 6. Oh, the Lord loves and chases and scourges every son whom he receives. Okay, he scourges. That means, scourges there means whip uh, or discipline. Or you use another word for it. You can say discipline. He disciplined those he receives. We already established the fact that the discipline could be what? It could be sickness. David, you'll see that in a minute. It could be some trouble that you are in, but don't always leave it up to that. Because remember, uh, Job didn't do anything wrong. He was upright and upstanding in everything he did. Now you know if anybody was going could 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 complain about why something was happening to them, it should have been him. And he did not complain, not once. 
Now, once in Job, in Job, he said this, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Isn't that something? In spite of all that he was going through, he probably couldn't even figure out, okay, okay, I did pray. I did do this. I did. I didn't talk bad to somebody. I didn't hit my wife. I didn't do. I, <laughs> you know, I, I'm a good guy, but I'm standing person. And now I got boils from the top of my head to the sole of my feet. First, before he got sick, remember he lost all his material possessions. He lost money first. See, because the devil said to God, the only reason Job is serving you is because he's wealthy. Well, that just threw a monkey wrench in the prosperity movement, isn't it? The only reason he's serving you is because he got money. God said, okay, I'll let you take the money from him. And he was still serving God. Okay, I got that wrong, God. The only reason he's serving you is because he has his health. All right, okay, touch his body, but you can't kill him. He still didn't turn his back on God. Because the devil told God, that he will curse you, take his health. He'll curse you and die. He'll do it. And he didn't do it. What do that say about us? Have you ever been in a situation where, number one, you didn't have a lot of money, or you were so sick you thought you was going to die, and you blame God? The first person we blame is God. The first person I hear people, God, why you do this to me? God, they angry with God. If they lost their parents when they were 10, they're angry with God. If they lost their job because of somebody else's mistake, they're angry with God. The first person they go to is God. And Job did not do that. And we're telling you today, don't do that because God is the one that did it. He allowed it because that's a test to see where you are in your faith. And if you blame him for some negative thing that's happening to you, as far as, God, why did you do this to me? Not why did you allow it? Because notice this, Job didn't say, Satan is doing this to me. Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Evidently, there had to be a teaching in the Old Testament that no matter what's going on in your life, God is behind it. Not that God is behind it, that he did it. That God is behind it. That he is more powerful than any other negative being, demon, whatever. That he's allowing it to happen for a reason. Because you don't hear Job make one negative comment about God. And when God gave him the opportunity, remember? When you, it's 40, it's 40 chapters in Job. God gives him the opportunity and Job began to curse the day that he was born. Remember? And he began to curse, and God stopped him and says, okay, Joel, you, you finished now. Listen, where were you when I put the stars in the sky? Where were you when I did this? Who are you to even talk negatively about your own life, about your own birth? And the Bible says, Joel put his hand over his mouth and began to repent even then. Who are we no matter what negative thing that's happening to us, it could be the chastening of the Lord. It could be because of your own sin, because we talked about this before. Some things that we go through is a direct consequence of a sin. That could be true. We talked about it Sunday in Sunday school. Venereal diseases is a direct consequence of sexual sin. That's, that's, a, that's a given. So if anybody had to raise their hand up and God, God, why did you do this to me? Uh, what you mean? Why? <laughs> you are in direct violation of what's going on. Me and my wife heard this alarming statistic uh, in Washington, D.C. We just watched a particular documentary on HIV. And if you think HIV has gone away, you are sadly mistaken in our community. In Washington, D.C. alone, Washington, D.C., in the African community, in American community, she said, listen to this, this alarming statistic, 65% of the African American population is HIV positive. In Washington, D.C., that's, that's half of the black community, over half of the black community in that state. And that is, is HIV positive. And then they began to tell the stories of 10 people. They followed 10 people's stories from the age of 20 all the way to 60. 
These people were HIV positive. People married them to people who had AIDS and didn't tell them they had it, and they married them, and they had they got contracted through that. They contracted HIV through many different ways. Uh, but the fact was, and here was the problem, the problem is this, nobody wants to talk about it. The church didn't want to talk about it, and that's the place we need to talk about it, is here. Nobody wants to expose this horrible disease so people can stay away from it or get tested. And then once again, we wonder why the concept, we talk about the consequences of certain things happening, certain things happen because of the behavior that we're involved in. But let's say we're, we're, we're the Job people. We didn't do anything wrong. Yet, you're being, you say you're not being chastened by God or you're just being tested. The thing is, no matter what negative thing that's happened to you, you got to be able to rise above it and say, God, you must be trying to teach me something. you got to say that. You can't mope. You, like David, here's David, he's complaining, he's moping about it, but he's not done. So, are you finished with verse 6? Yeah. Read verse 7. And then the 7 and 8. Oh, you closed it up. But why, why are you finding that again? Notice what David says also. He finished this verse. He says, nor chasten me in your hot pursuit. And that's Hebrews 7, uh, verse 7 and verse 8. Uh, the, the chastening is clear. God only chastens those people he loves. You got it? Verse 7, yeah. Yeah, verse 7 and 8. Verse 7. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chase? So, if you've been chastened, you're a son. Meaning son and daughter of God. You are. If you're being chastened, if you're going through trouble, see, that, that gets me with this word faith stuff, this prosperity stuff, because they tell you you're not supposed to go through trouble. See, you got Jesus on your side now. Why are you going through this? See, if you really was on God's side, you wouldn't be going through that. That's not true. The devil won't attack you even more because you are on God's side. You, you come, look, ever since I've been going to that church, I got a flat tire. This happened to me. Dad, I'm going to stop going to that church. See, that? that's what he wants you to stop going. You think just because you go to church that everything is supposed to happen positive to you. And it's the opposite. When you begin to live for God, negative things are going to come your way. Two reasons. Because of your consequences. If that's not it, then it's because Satan is trying to get you to walk away. It's a test of your faith. It's a test of your faith. He wants you to walk away. And then I think uh, it was Jesus who talked about it too. He says, uh, uh, some people love to come to church and they, as soon as they hear the word, they receive it immediately. They jump, they shout, but as soon as a trial comes, as soon as trouble comes, they run away. He says the reason they run away is because the seed wasn't planted deep, deep enough in them. They weren't rooted and grounded in the word in the first place. That's why they ran. So you got to be careful. The test is what happens to you out there. That's the test. Not what happens to you inside here. Inside these four walls, people, you know, they say, oh, we had a good time in church. We ran around a couple of times, did some car wheels, you know, spoke in different languages. I saw a couple of people get healed, and we did all that. But when I went out there, all this stuff started happening to me. Now, see, you're basing your experience in here, the emotionalism, in church and thinking that that is supposed to spill over to your everyday life. It is not that. You are going to be attacked by the devil. We've got to understand that. That's a part of life. And so David is saying here, uh, Lord, even in your heart, verse 1, nor chasten me in your heart, displeasure. Finish verse 8. But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not son. If God don't chasten you, you're not his child. That's what Hebrews is saying. Read it again. Write it down. Hebrews 12, 5 through 8. You're chastened by God because you are his child. If you don't, if you're not going through nothing, if you get yeah, every day is sunny and happy, every day is a, a bowl of just roses, you better check to see if you're in faith. <coughs> you need to. You, you talk about you want these prosperity preachers talk about they, you need to have a million dollars in your bank account and, and everything is supposed to be sunny and happy. Yeah, okay, not in this world. That's just like telling the military in a time of war that uh, there's really no fighting going on, but we got war going on right now. So just go ahead and wear the, the, the brightest, just wear your dress blues. 
when you're going out there fighting. See, they don't wear the dress, you wear dress blues when you come back from victory and you're marching down in your best outfit. They're wearing the fatigues, the green, and stuff that you're fighting. Now, the prosperity movement wants us to wear the dress blues while we're supposed to be fighting. You're in a war. You're in a battle now. And how long the battle going to last? Till Jesus come. That's how long it's going to last. So don't put your dress blues on yet. That's not time to put them on yet. We put them on after uh, the tribulation period. When Jesus comes and rules this earth for a thousand years. That's when we should start talking about that. But until then, we need to always be conscious that Satan is trying to destroy us. He's trying to get us off our square, trying to get us to walk away from God. Look at verse 2 and 3. Verse 2 and 3 now. Two kinds of trouble. Two kinds of trouble. Verse 2 and 3. Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I am weak. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are troubled. My soul also is greatly troubled. But you, O Lord, how long? Two kinds of trouble he mentions here in verse 2 and 3. Sickness, have mercy on me, O Lord, for I am weak. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are troubled. So you can be tested through sickness. Yes, you can. And let's say it's cancer, and you have cancer, and you don't get healed. Does that mean God don't love you? That means that's the method he chose to bring you on home. It doesn't mean that he loves you any less. So if, the, if you get a negative report from the doctor, you still got to praise God. You still got to say, God, I don't know why. I don't know why, but I'm going to still serve you until the day I leave here. Until, uh, unless, you know, until I lose my, my strength in my body, I'm going to serve you. David is saying, my bones are aching. So I don't know if he, if he was sick at this moment, which we believe, according to this psalm, that he was, uh, God allowed sickness to be upon him. He asked God to heal him. And David looked at it as chastening. Verse 1. Remember? Then he says this. Not only did he talk about that type of trouble, he mentioned another trouble. My soul also was greatly troubled. Not only was his body aching, his mind was in trouble. His, his soul was aching. So he was getting a double whammy. I mean, he didn't have any relief anywhere. So with his penitence of asking God for forgiveness and asking God, and God to, to lift just a little pressure off him, God is allowing David to go through this. Why? Because he's testing him. And it's the same thing with us. We will be, your faith is, just, is going to be tested. And we gotta begin to start teaching once again that uh, every day is not uh, going to be a sunny day for us. It's just not. You're not going to be healthy 100% of the time every day till you die. It's not going to happen. You're going to get sick sometime. I prepare myself for sickness. I prepare these preachers for sickness. Now listen, if I'm not there because I'm sick, it's your turn. What if I look like a pastor talking about, well, you know, I preach every Sunday. Ain't nothing going to happen to me because I got the anointing of the Lord in my life. That's when I run into a car accident and I'm in the hospital six months. I saw the preacher said that. I heard Fred Price say he never, had, he never had a cold since he got saved. What if the Lord did the rest of your voice? Oh, yeah. <laughs> like Jamal Harrison Bryant, you know, the doctors put him on voice rest, you know. Uh, some preachers put, you know, you saw about him. But I heard preachers say some crazy things about their anointing and how so anointed they are that I guess God is the only person that's going to use them. That's not true. you got to be prepared for everything. And what about these preachers that's running around trying to preach in everybody's church? You know, you got, they, they start all these churches, but they want to preach in every last one of them. How long do you think they're going to keep that up? They're only human. You Eventually, you're going to have to put somebody over one of them churches. And somebody's going to have to preach consistently in a church. You can't keep ripping and running because your body's not going to let you do it. And Satan is going to attack you 
one way or the other, and you got to have something in place. we got to be prepared for that. Oh, as Martin Luther King said, you know, we got to do a better job of preparing our children for real life. He said, you need to tell your children failure is a part, is just as a much a part of life as success. Now, I don't know if people ever told me, say, I don't know if people tell their kids that, but you need to tell your children that they're going to get some doors slammed in their face. It's just going to happen. If you think, oh, Buki, everybody love you. They love you, Buki, that's right. After you graduate from high school, get your degree, nobody's going to turn you away. You're going to get the, doc, the job that you have. You're not going to, nobody's going to turn you down in the interview. If that's what you told your kids, they're going to be in a sad <laughs> awakening for real life when they realize that everybody don't like them like you do. You've got to tell them to prepare themselves for failure as well as success. And that's what God is telling us as Christians. We need to be prepared for the negative. We're not. We're, I don't think we are. And we don't hear messages about it anymore anyway. People don't even want the preacher to talk about anything negative anymore. They don't. They don't want to talk about hell. They don't want to talk about judgment. They don't want the preacher to talk about anything negative because it straightens them up. It gets them to think about where their life is and how they could end up in eternity. He says he was weak in his bones. Then he said his, his soul was troubled. There's another thing. He says, how long? How long? David sits he was under the chastisement of God, but he still knew he should ask God to shorten the trial. It's, it, it's not a problem for you to say, Lord, how long? That's not, that's, that's not a problem to ask, because he's still going to do it in his own time. You can say how long you want to. He, Lord, how long are you want to? I'll let you be sick until you die if you want to, but you should say, Lord, let your will be done. David is asking, Lord, how long, meaning, how long is this trial is going to last? How long am I going to stay sick? Uh, you know, sometimes when you, you think about it, I think I told you about this before. Uh, it was a program that I watch every Sunday, uh, John Ingerberg, and I really love his program for this reason only, uh, that he has all these guests, these well-known guests that comes on, pastors and writers, Christian pastors and writers, and these people have sicknesses. I mean sick. They are in pain 24-7. But yet, one pastor was in a wheelchair. Still pastor. But he has pain from the top of, he was, uh, from the, from the top of the back of his neck all the way to his toes. He said he's in pain constantly. But yet, God still uses them. One day, was a paraplegic. Quad, quadriplegic. But hands and feet. But yet, she's in pain constantly. But yet she still writes. People dictate, she dictates to them. Now, if people like that can be used by God, what's our excuse? I got two hands and legs and walking, and I, 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 can't, I can't give God no excuse why I'm not serving him. When you got people wrapped with pain every day and get up and say, God, I'm going to serve you, sick or not, I'm still going to serve you. See, sickness should not stop you. If, if, that, if at all possible, it's not. It shouldn't. If you have the ability to move and still talk about God, then do it to that ability. Because God wants to get the glory even through your sickness and through your trial. That's, I mean, I, I just love, I would love to hear more testimonies like that. I would love to hear more testimonies of how people persevered through the trial. Through the problem, through the pain. Now, I don't want to hear no more testimonies of how you got a thousand dollars. I want to hear a testimony how you were sick, and while you were sick, you were still praising God. And while you were sick, you still witnessed to somebody about Jesus Christ. And while you was racking in pain, somebody else didn't know you were in pain, and you still helped them. And they didn't even know. They didn't even know. You still gave them your food. You still gave them your money. When you could have easily kept all that to yourself and used excuse, no, it's for my sickness. You, you, you could have done that. David is saying how long? Don't say how long because it's not urgent. He says, return, O Lord, deliver me. Now, once again, remember, we're looking at the, the mindset of David. He says this plea, return. Return also shows that David felt distant from God. Sin will cause you to feel distant from God. He asked God to return to him. When David, all he had to do was open up his mouth and ask God for forgiveness. God never left. When we sin, we leave him. That's what happens when we sin. Notice what he says, save me for your mercy's sake. 
Meaning this, that God, even in our confession, God is so merciful, he will still forgive us of our sins. You know 1 John, uh, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and do what? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There is no sin, I'm trying to tell you, no sin that's too big that God cannot forgive. Not one. Only sin that God can't forgive is because you're dead and you can't ask for it when you're dead is asking God to come into your life. That's a little bit too late. I accept Jesus. No, you in hell now, so you can't accept Jesus now. You should have did that while you was alive. You I bet your whole lot of folks repenting right now in hell, but that's a little bit too late. While you got but you the blood running warm in your body. You should be asking God now. Uh, David is going to say something like this. Right. The next verse. He says that. I think he says in verse uh, 5. That's verse 5. Yeah, because I missed. Yeah, here it is. Verse 4 and 5. It says this. Return, O Lord, deliver me. O save me from your, for your mercy's sake. But here it is. For in death there is no remembrance of you. In the grave, who will give you thanks? Oh, the Jehovah Witness loves this verse. They love it. They love it. There's a lot of verses in the Old Testament like this. They say, because of this verse and verses like this, that there is no hell. This is what the verse they use. Notice what David said. For in death, there is no remembrance of you. So the Jehovah Witness concluded that if there's no remembrance of God in death, then how can people be in hell if there's no remembrance of God? They don't remember nothing, so they can't be there. That's their conclusion. That's not what David is talking about. David is not, and once again, Old Testament, David don't have the full knowledge that you and I have about the afterlife. But I believe that David and the people in Old Testament knew there was an afterlife. What David is referring to, what commentator said this, and I, I accept this more so than this, for in death there is no remembrance of you in the grave who will give you thanks. While we on this earth, in our physical bodies, all we know is that through our physical bodies we give God praise and glory. What David is saying here, when you dead, you can't do that. You can't praise them in this body when you're dead. Because all David and the Old Testament people know is that that body is six feet under. And how are you going to get up and praise him? This is what he's saying. How can you remember God when that body is in the grave? He's not going further and talking about where that soul and spirit goes. He's only referring to the body when he says you cannot remember and you can't give God thanks. You can't praise him like you can while you are alive. But had he read 1 Corinthians, write this down, 1 Corinthians 15, that's the chapter that tells us that there is an afterlife and where the spirit goes and, and after we die. Uh, it, it was Paul that says from the, well, from, to be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. So David was only referring to the physical body. When they talk about death in the Old Testament, they talk about the body. The Jehovah Witnesses are thinking that they're talking about the soul and the spirit, but the soul and the spirit never dies. Only the body. And then the body dies, and I love the term that they use, sleep. The body is just sleep, as Paul would say, and Jesus would say. Oh, when Lazarus is dead, he's only sleeping. That's what Jesus said. So that's the term that, that the, about death. We, we got to look at it from God's perspective, not from their perspective. It was one Caucasian person said they love the way African Americans use the term pass away. They don't, yeah, and I just noticed that we do use that term uh, instead of saying he died. Because, you know, white folks, they say he died. You know, he did. <laughs> but we say pass away. And they love that term because it's more endearing of saying passing away than just saying the person is dead. Because we believe pass away means they pass from one part and move to the next part. Pass away. That's what we believe. That that person is just, he's not dead. He, his body is sleeping, but his spirit and his soul lives on. Jehovah's Witnesses, no. They don't see that. I, I have a whole lot of scriptures I could have given you. As a matter of fact, write these down. Just a few, just to give you I'm going to have to copy this one sheet to give you. I just found it while I was here. And here's a whole lot of scriptures 
of what they thought about hell. I mean, about the grave. Sheol, the grave. Write this one down. A lot of them are found in Job. Job 14. 14 through verse 15. 14 and 15. Job 14, verse 14, 15. Job 19, verse 25 through 27. And then a few more in Psalms. I'm going to give you a few. I'll just print this out next week to pass to you about death. Psalms 16, verse 10. Psalms 49, verse 15. So that is Job 14, verse 14, 15. Job 19, verse 25 through 27. Psalms 16, verse 10. And Psalms 49, verse 15. Now those scriptures deal with death. They deal with death and how uh, we as Christians are passing away. Not, you know, just gone. You know, we are passed away. The body is just sleeping. We, we remember that. So, uh, he says, return verse 4 and 5, for death, there is no remembrance of you in the grave. Who will give you thanks? Uh, look at 23. I mean, on my page, is page 23. He says, save me for your mercy's sake. The notes of God giving us forgiveness if we confess. In death, there's no remembrance. We went over that part. We go to verse 24. St. Timothy. That was verse 4 and 5. Let's look at verse 6 and 7. Verse 6 and 7 is a vivid description of David's agony. I'm going to read it. Verse 6 and 7 says, I am weary with my groaning. All night I make my bed swim. I drench my couch with my tears. My eyes waste away because of grief. It grows old because of all my enemies. He says this, I am weary with growing. God's chastening hand was heavy upon David. His life seemed to be nothing but tears and misery. Have you ever been in a situation where you just cried your eyes out <laughs> over a situation and a problem? This is what's happening to David. He is crying out to God. He is really pouring himself out uh, to the Lord about his situation. Really, you don't get too many people like that. You don't get too many people that will cry over their sins. I think it was one of um, when we went over the Beatitudes and um, in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus talked about crying over your sins. And he literally meant that. We should be so sorry that we are sinning that it should make us weep like David is. Literally weep. He's not, this is not a metaphor. We should be actually hurt that we have turned our backs on God, just, even if it's just for a little while, in one sin, and ask God for forgiveness. He says we should do that. He says, all night I make my bed swim. And this is a good example of poetic exaggeration. David didn't want us to believe that his bed actually floated on a pool of tears in his room because this is a poetic literature. So what is he saying? When he says, all night I make my bed to swim. Cried my eyes out. Cried my eyes out. He goes a little further and says, watch this, I drench my couch with my tears. My eyes waste away because of grief. When he says my eyes waste away, he says my eyes are bloodshot red because I'm just crying. He just cry. And he's using poetic talk to really bring out a fact that he was really hurt, that he's really sorry for what he's done. Now, if this is the sin between him and that Sheba, he's really sorry for it. As we already know that the baby died. Uh, she didn't, the baby didn't make it. And you know, he was really, he was upset about that. Now, this particular sin, he's really upset. So that's why people uh, try to say that this particular sin, so it doesn't really matter what sin it was, David was really calling out to God for forgiveness. He knew that the chastening of God was happening upon him. Do you recognize when the chastening of God is on you? And if you say, and we already established the fact that God still chastens today because he chastens those whom he loves. We really need to be, here's another word that we, we need to use a lot, sensitive to the Holy Spirit. We, are so, we should be sensitive to the Holy Spirit to recognize when we're wrong and not be ashamed to say, God, I'm sorry. We, gotta be, we just got to be that sensitive. 
We got to be that serious with him, understanding that God does understand. He is forgiving. Uh, one scripture says, uh, you know, God is not a man. So he is well understanding that any human being can ever be. And we try to put God on our level. That's the problem. We, put, we try to put God on our level, and we try to make God like us. Because we get upset like this, we think God would do the same thing. And he's not like us. He is not a man. He is very forgiving. He is long-suffering. He is patient. You know he can't be like us because he let the world stay this long. Six, almost 7,000 years and folks still doing what they're doing. We know if that would have been one of us, we would start over a million times. Oh, <laughs> okay, so we're going back to the drawing board. I ain't even let five days get by. Uh -uh, we're going to start this all over again. But God is not a man. He doesn't think like us. He is not us. And that's why he's long-suffering and patient and kind. And we should thank God for it because, because of his long-suffering and kindness, some of our loved ones got saved. Some of our family members got saved. Some of our co-workers got saved because of God's long-suffering and because of God's kindness. He tarried long enough so some of us can be born again. He did not return and has not returned yet because he's still reaping. I'll preach on that Sunday. The harvest is ripe, but the laborers are few. God is still reaping. He's going to reap until all the way to the rapture. He's going to reap those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. If we don't believe that, we should be preparing for that, and we should be preaching in accordance with that, that every person that comes through this church, it was amazing how uh, Sunday, the people that joined, listen to this, the people that joined Sunday were people that were walking by church, just walking by. Three people. Brought one lady, brought four, she had four kids. Another lady had three kids. And, and when we opened the doors of the church, all of them came right down here. Well, how did you get here? I was just walking by and the Holy Spirit let me come to this church. All right. Two families came that way Sunday. So, just think if the Holy Spirit tired of us waiting, <laughs> it's like, let me know what, let me send them families over there. <laughs> they need to go up there and go get them folks. And here God sending folks in here, and really the job is for us to go out there and get them. That's the job. That's what we're supposed to do. That's what we're preaching about Sunday. And it's amazing how that passage of scripture that I'm preaching from, it falls right in place. I'm not even out of order. I'm going straight, verse by verse, through our series of the ministry of Jesus, and so happily, this Sunday, he falls on the passage of scripture that says the labors of, uh, the harvest is right, but the laborers are few. That's amazing. Here, David is weeping. Let's finish. Did we finish the last verse? Okay, 8 through 10. Here's amazing. You heard all of that crying and, and, and weeping and wailing. He closed with this. 8 through 10, David's confident declaration, depart from me, all you workers of iniquity, for the Lord has heard the voice of my weeping, the Lord has heard my supplication, the Lord will receive my prayer, let all my enemies be ashamed and greatly troubled, let them turn back and be ashamed suddenly. You, his whole attitude will change. Because by the end of this prayer, this is a prayer, he says, God going to do it. He going to turn it around. He going to pull me out. He going to stop disciplining me because this is only a season that I'm being disciplined. He says right here, so guess what, you workers of iniquity, watch out. I can't hang out with you no more. And that's why some commentators said maybe he was involved in a particular sin because now he's telling them, uh, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Uh, I can't hang out with y'all no more. Y'all got me in trouble. <laughs> y'all got me in trouble. And he says, well, the Lord has heard the voice of of my weeping. How did he know that God heard him? How did he know that? He was crying, Lord, stop the discipline or lighten the discipline. And he says the Lord heard him. So when you pray and you're asking God to lighten the load, God hears you. He knows. We just need to call on him. You're going to I just love the Psalms because that's what you're going to hear over and over again. Call on the Lord. Don't be ashamed. Don't think you, you bothering God. Don't think you're getting on his nerves because you're not. I don't care if you call him a thousand times that same day. Don't, uh, don't think you're worrying God. It reminds me of Jesus. I'm going to close with this. Jesus said this. Uh, and Peter thought he was doing something. When Jesus asked the question, how many times 
Should you forgive somebody? And Peter, boy, he thought he said so seven times seven. No, seven times. Seven times. And uh, Jesus said, no. He said seven times seventy. I don't know, Peter probably's like, okay, that's 490 times. Who's going to do something to me in one day? 490 times. Really, Jesus was using it as a metaphor, always forgive. That's what he was saying. Because in, in 24 hours a day, who's going to do something to you 490 times? And if they do something to you 490 times, and they get to the 491 time, you still, you still got to forgive them. In other words, forgive them. Now, if God does that, if God, if Jesus says that's how we should forgive, then that's why we see here, God says, he heard David. David said, he heard me when I weep. Then he says, the Lord has heard my supplication. The Lord will receive my prayer. You must believe when you pray, God hears you. I, I, don't, I just can't say that enough. I hear too many Christians thinking that if they call me and pray for them, then the prayer won't get through. What? No. You need to know that your faith in God is just as powerful as my faith. Because that means I shouldn't be working because all I got to do is my faith can get y'all through all y'all problems. I can just sit at home and wait on y'all to call me. <laughs> so we can get all y'all problems solved. It don't work that way because I got to call on God for myself. And I got to say, Lord, help me. And Lord, forgive me. And Lord, deliver me. I got to do that just like you do. I want to teach people, call on him for yourself. Because guess what? I ain't going to be there always. The person you leaning on ain't going to be there always. But God is always there. Always. He'll be there forever until the end. We're going to close with that. Close with the Lord. A hand clap of praise. Thank God for Psalm 6. The next week, Psalm 7. Uh, we'll, we'll go over that one as well. I'll give you an outline. Because I think the last outline I gave everybody was Psalm 6. So I have a new outline for you next week. Sister. Uh, don't think I had that outline for you. The one I've been promising. <laughs> I do have that for you today. But uh, let us all stand. We received the offering already, right? Okay, that's good. Uh, but let us all stand and we're going to pray for this missile. Remember, this Sunday is uh, Family and Friends Day. So please invite your family and friends. Come out. We're going to have dinner uh, for them as well. So just invite them to come on out and have a good time. Let's bow our heads. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you once again for allowing us to be in your presence. Thank you for these, your people who are here tonight. As we understand now, uh, just a little bit more of how you chasten us and how trials and tribulations, we can look at them in different ways. But even whatever is happening to us, we should always say, Lord, what are you trying to teach us? And we're going to let your will be done. Lord, yes, we know it's difficult when we're going through it. It is difficult. We don't understand it. It is painful. But, Father, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you that you said you would not put on us no more than what we can bear. And we ask that when our time comes to be tested, Father, that we will still stand and not reject Christ. And when it's our time to be chastened, we take it, Father. We, we know that you love us because you chasing us through these trials and tribulations. And Lord, we thank you for that bit of information today of understanding that you have not thrown us away. You have not gotten rid of us. You have turned your love toward us that we can become better Christians for you. Lord, as we dismiss from this place, Lord, as they travel the, the streets and highways, Father, we ask that they will uh, arrive to their several destinations and find everything in order. In Jesus' name, amen.